Hello students, Mr. Courtney here. In this video, we're continuing on energy and we're looking at measuring and expressing enthalpy change. Our objectives will be to define enthalpy, describe how to measure the change in enthalpy of a reaction, and describe how to express the enthalpy change. So we start with thermochemistry. Thermochemistry is a study of heat changes that occurs in chemical reactions. Or you can say the changes that occurs in physical and chemical processes. Now we have to remember what energy is. Remember that energy is the capacity or the ability to do work or produce heat. All right. So energy that is stored within the structures of substances is called chemical energy or chemical potential energy since they are stored. So for example, when gasoline burns, the potential energy stored in its chemical bonds is released to do work, such as propelling a car. Heat is the energy transferred from one object to another. So the energy transfer is due to a temperature difference between the two objects. The heat is always going to flow from the warmer object to the cooler object. Now in chemistry, we take the system's point of view. And the system is our reaction. So we're focused on what is happening, what is reacting. The surroundings, the surroundings will be everything else in the universe. And the heat flow is given from the system's point of view. So does the system absorb energy or does it release energy? And we have to remember here that the law of conservation of energy states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it's just changed from one form to another. So that means the total energy of the universe remains constant, which is summed up as the law, the first law of thermodynamics. Enthalpy, which is given the symbol H, refers to the heat content of the system. It is the energy that flows as heat during a reaction at constant pressure. The change in enthalpy is also called the heat of reaction. And the reactions are carried out at 101.3 kilopascals or one atmosphere and at 25 degrees Celsius, which is 298 Kelvin. We use calorimetry to measure the heat transfer into or out of a system and whether it's a physical or a chemical process. The heat loss by the system is equal to the heat gained by the surroundings. And so as we're talking about heat, that means delta H or the change in enthalpy is also equal to the heat gained or heat lost. So whether the system loses or gains heat, the surrounding will gain or lose that same amount of heat. So we can use that relationship between enthalpy and the heat change or Q to calculate enthalpy. So we have endothermic and exothermic reactions. In this way, we can see what we have in terms of our reactants here and our products. And that's for an endothermic reaction. Here we can see that the products have more energy than our reactants. So in an endothermic reaction, the system absorbs energy. So the amount of energy of the products would increase. So that means the products have more stored energy than the reactants. Then when we look at our exothermic reaction, we'll see here that the products have less energy than the reactants. That means the system loses heat or loses energy to the surroundings. So the products have less stored energy than our reactants. When we look at calculating delta H or the change in enthalpy, we always do final minus initial. So whenever we see that symbol delta here, it tells us we're calculating a change in whatever unit or quantity rather that follows it. So in this case, we're looking at enthalpy. So that's a change in enthalpy. And we always do final minus initial. So in this case, we're going to do the enthalpy of our products minus the enthalpy of our reactants. When we see this, because in an endothermic reaction, the products have more energy than our reactants, we're subtracting a smaller number from a larger number because the reactants have less energy than the products. Therefore, delta H will be a positive value. It will be greater than zero. For our exothermic reaction, since the products have less stored energy, we're subtracting a larger number 
from a smaller number. That means our delta H will have a negative value or it will be less than zero. So if you look at this question we're given here, we're given that 25 milliliters of water, which contains 0 0.025 moles of hydrochloric acid at 25 degrees Celsius is added to 25 milliliters of water, which contains 0 0.025 moles of sodium hydroxide at the same 25 degrees Celsius in a foam cup calorimeter. Calculate the enthalpy change and the enthalpy change is wanted in kilojoules during this reaction if the highest temperature observed is 32 degrees Celsius. And we have to assume that the densities of the solution are 1.00 grams per milliliter and that the volume of the final solution is equal to the volume, the sum of the volumes of the reacting solutions. So we start by determining the total volume, which would be 50 milliliters. We do our change in temperature, our final temperature minus our initial. We know 32 was our final because it was the highest temperature observed. And we started at 25 degrees Celsius, so our change is 7.0. The specific heat of water is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. Now, we know the density of the solution, but we need to find its mass. We know the relationship between density and volume and mass. So we can use that relationship to solve, to solve, sorry, for the mass, which will give us 50.0 grams. Now then we have to think about this. What is the system and what is the surroundings? The system is what is actually reacting. So in this case, our hydrochloric acid or 0 0.025 moles of hydrochloric acid and 0 0.025 moles of sodium hydroxide will be our system and the solution that they're in is our surroundings. Now, since the temperature change increased, the temperature of the solution increased from 25 to 32 degrees Celsius, that indicates that the reaction is exothermic. Thus, delta H has to be negative. So that means it is the negative value of the heat gained by the surroundings because the temperature of the surroundings increased from 25 degrees Celsius to 32 degrees Celsius. And we know the mass of our solution. So now we can substitute those values into our equation, mc delta t, and solve for the heat change or the enthalpy change in this case. We get 1,500 joules when, we, when it's rounded off to two significant figures. But since we want that in kilojoules, it's 1.5 kilojoules. And it's negative because... We know that the temperature increased. That tells us that the reaction is exothermic. Thus, delta H is negative. So the system released that amount of energy. So now we're going to look at thermochemical equations. And we know what a chemical equation is already. So now we're going to add thermo to it. A thermochemical equation shows is a balanced equation with enthalpy change included. And we must also include the physical states of our reactants and products. So in this case here, we have calcium oxide plus water to give us calcium hydroxide. And calcium hydroxide, which, which is in aqueous, plus 65.2 kilojoules. That tells us the reaction is exothermic. Since our heat is a product, that means it was produced. It was given off. It was released. We can also... Re to tell that delta H is negative. So we can write it as negative 65.2 for our delta H, all because we see it on the product side. So whenever your enthalpy or your heat of reaction is written as a product, that means our reaction is exothermic. When calcium carbonate solid decomposes to give us calcium oxide solid and carbon dioxide as a gas, it requires or it absorbs 177.8 kilojoules of energy. That is our heat of reaction, our enthalpy change. And since it is written as a reactant, that means it is positive. So the heat is absorbed. Now we can use these thermochemical equations to calculate energy changes that occur in chemical reactions. So does the physical state matter? Why is it we must include the physical states? of our substances when we write thermochemical equations. 
No, look at these reactions. They have similar substances because we start both with water. The only thing that's different is that we have liquid water in our first equation and we have water vapor in the second equation. The products are the same. Hydro <coughs> hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. But if you look at the heat of reaction for the first one, liquid water to hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, delta H is 285.8. But when we look at gaseous or water vapor to hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, it is 241.8. So there's a difference between these two. But the, because they're in different physical states, that results in di different delta H values or in heats of reaction. The difference here is 44.0 kilojoules. That means if we take one mole of liquid water or the vaporization of one mole of liquid water to water vapor at 25 degrees Celsius, requires 44.0 kilojoules of heat. So let's look at this question. We're told to use the following thermochemical equation to calculate the amount of heat in kilojoules required to decompose 2.24 moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate solid. So we look at the reaction. The thermochemical equation tells us, or it indicates that 85 kilojoules are required are needed to decompose two moles of hydrogen carbonate, sodium hydrogen carbonate. So first we're gonna write a conversion factor that relates kilojoules of heat and moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. We know that we need 85 kilojoules for every two moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Now since we're given 2.24 moles, that means delta H or the enthalpy changes 2.24 moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate multiplied by our conversion factor of 85 kilojoules for every two moles. Our moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate will cancel. We multiply the 2.24 by 85, and that gives us 95 kilojoules. So if we look at heat of combustion, all right, so it's a heat of reaction of enthalpy change that, that accompanies the complete burning of one mole of a substance. And this is what your thermochemical equation will look like. So in this case, methane is burnt in the presence of oxygen to give us carbon dioxide, gas, and water as a gas. And that releases 890 kilojoules. That means it is an exothermic reaction since the heat or the heat of reaction is on our product side. Now, a bomb calorimeter is used to determine the heat of combustion. And so a weighed sample is ignited and burned in an atmosphere of pure oxygen. The energy, energy that is generated warms the steel bomb and the surroundings. The initial and final temperatures of the water is, is measured and the temperature change is used to calculate the energy evolved by the reaction as heat. So that's how we use the bomb calorimeter to determine the enthalpy of a reaction for or the heat of combustion for our particular substances. We can use this method to determine the amount of calories in food. Now we're going to talk about the heat or the enthalpy that accompanies a change of state. We start with the heat of fusion and solidif solidification. Heat of fusion or the molar heat of fusion is the heat required to melt one mole of a solid at a constant temperature. And the heat of solidif solidification, the molar heat, is the heat required to freeze one mole of a liquid at a constant temperature. It is important to note that during a phase change, where it's going from a solid to liquid, liquid to solid, the temperature remains constant. So there is no temperature change. So at that point, there will be a mixture of solid and liquid, or there will be a mixture of the substances within the two phases. So let's look at this. So for water going from a solid to a liquid, the heat of fusion is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. For liquid water going to a solid, the heat of solidification or the molar heat of solidification is negative 6.01 kilojoules per mole. 
So here we see that heat has to be absorbed when we go in one direction and heat has to be released as we go in the opposite direction. Now you notice as you go from liquid to solid, it's negative 6.01. But as you go from solid to liquid, it's positive 6.01. So the heat absorbed by a melting solid is the same quantity of heat released when the solid, when the liquid solidifies. So they're equal but opposite. So the heat required to freeze will be the same as the heat required to melt it, or the heat released when that solid is melted. So the heat of fusion is equal to the negative heat of solidification. So in this problem, we're asked how many grams of ice at zero degrees Celsius will melt if 2.25 kilojoules of heat are added. We know that the heat of fusion or the molar enthalpy of fusion is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. So every mole requires 6.01 kilojoules. But since we're given 2.25 kilojoules, we need to find how many moles of that substance we can have. How many moles of the ice it will melt. So to find the mass of ice, we first go from kilojoules to the moles. We need to use the conversion factor that relates to molar enthalpy of fusion and moles of, of solid water or ice. Now that we have that, our kilojoules will cancel. So we left with moles of solid wat water or moles of ice. Now, since we have moles, we need to go from moles to grams. Multiply by the molar mass of water and we get 6.74 grams of water or grams of ice. Sorry, so that's how many grams of ice that will melt if we have 2.25 kilojoules of heat being added. So now we're going to talk about heat of vaporization and heat of condensation. So the molar heat of vaporization, heat required to vaporize one mole of a liquid. And the heat of condensation is the heat required to condense one mole of a vapor. And again, what are we going from the vapor state, the liquid to the vapor, or the vapor to the liquid? That change is, is going to occur at a, temp, at a constant temperature. So there will be no temperature change. Again, the substance will exist in both phases for some point in time as it goes from the liquid to the vapor or from the vapor to the liquid. So let's use water as our example. Here we see that the molar heat of vaporization is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. And for condensation is negative 40.7 kilojoules per mole. So here we see again, the quantity of heat absorbed by the vaporizing liquid is the same as the quantity of heat released when the vapor condenses. It's the same value, but the signs will be different. Molar heat of vaporization is equal to the negative molar heat of condensation. In this question, we're asked how much heat in kilojoules is absorbed when 24.8 grams of liquid water at 100 degrees Celsius and 101.3 kilopascals is converted to water vapor at 100 degrees Celsius. So we're given the equation for the conversion of the liquid water to water vapor. And we're given that the molar heat heat of vaporization is 40.7 40 kilojoules for each mole. So the first thing we're going to do is write a conversion factor that con connects the heat of vaporization to moles of liquid water. And we know from the equation we need 40.7 kilojoules for each mole of liquid water. But we're given the mass of water. So first we need to find how many moles of water is contained in that 2.48 grams of water. So we do our conversion, 2.48 grams of the liquid water divided by its molar mass, which is 18.0 grams of water. Now that we have our moles of water, we can simply multiply by our conversion factor. Since 40.7 kilojoules is required per mole, we need 56.1 kilojoules. So the heat of solution or the molar heat of solution is the heat change that accompanies the dissolution of one mole of a substance. Whether that substance absorbs energy endothermic or it releases energy exothermic as it breaks apart into its ions. So in a hot pack, you have 
calcium chloride crystals in one packet and you have liquid water in another packet. When you squeeze it and you break the packet that or the pouch that contains your liquid water, the calcium chloride and the water mixes. Calcium chloride dissolutes. It breaks apart into its ions. And then your heat of solution is negative 82.8. And since it's negative, remember that's an exothermic reaction. So heat is released. So that's how you get your hot pack. On the other hand, you have cold packs. And in a cold pack usually contains ammonium nitrate crystals with water. Similar process. When you break the squeeze it and you break the pouch containing the ammonium, the water, it mixes with the ammonium nitrate. We form the ammonium ions and nitrate ions with a heat of solution of 25.7 kilojoules. Since it's positive, that tells us it absorbs energy from the surroundings or the system absorbs energy, making it an endothermic reaction. And that's how we get the cold feeling. That's how your cold packs and your hot packs work. So it's all related to chemistry. So next time you use a cold pack or a hot pack, you're looking at the heat of solution of the substances involved. So if you look at this question, it asks us how much heat in kilojoules is released when 2.5 moles of sodium hydroxide is dissolved in water. We're given the equation for the dissolution of sodium hydroxide and we're given the molar heat of the solution or molar heat of solution, sorry, which is negative 44.5. So that tells us it's an exothermic reaction. So we write a conversion factor related heat of solution and moles of sodium hydroxide. We know 44.5 kilojoules is produced for every mole of sodium hydroxide that is used. If we use 2.50 moles of sodium hydroxide, then we're going to multiply that by our conversion factor. How many kilojoules is produced per mole? And then we get a value of 111 kilojoules. So here we've seen what we call phase change diagrams, or sometimes we call them just a heating curve. A heating curve graphically describes the enthalpy changes occurring during physical changes. So here we see in this region here, right? The heating of the solid ice makes the, its temperature rise. So as we heat the solid ice, its temperature will rise until it gets to its melting point. And at that point, more heat is added without a temperature increase. So that's why the temperature is constant. So that means we're changing from a solid to a liquid. So at this point here, we'll have a mixture of solids and liquids. And if you heat the liquid water it makes its temperature rise until we get to its boiling point at 100 degrees celsius more heat is added to liquid water but the temperature does not rise so we have a constant so at that point here along this straight line we have a mixture of our phases the water will exist as both liquid and gas all right and that here is its boiling point now above 100 degrees celsius you continue to heat the liquid water no phase transitions is going to occur. More heat only leads to higher temperature. So at this point, the temperature of your vapor will just continue to increase. And that just shows us our, shows us our enthalpy change. So here we have our enthalpy of fusion, if we go in this direction, and that's our enthalpy of vaporization. Okay, this takes us to the end of this video. Until the next time, I'm out. Blessings.